One of the um, uh, images or graphics that I like to share with people when we talk about uh, safety of food products um, goes back many years now. And uh, in North Dakota, uh, 12 people uh, died from uh, consumption of uh, a homed canned product. So uh, we don't want you uh, to, to be the ones to cause the death of anyone. So it's very important to think about safety along with developing something that tastes great. So that's uh, a very important thing uh, to remember. So with this particular uh, presentation then, I will highlight uh, some of the product development uh, basics. Uh, we're not gonna, of course, cover everything. Uh, we actually uh, teach a product development class on campus that we have that runs for a whole semester. So it's, it's tough to cover everything in, in a short amount of time. I also will talk about sensory evaluation. Uh, sensory evaluation is um, really addresses the question, do people really like my product? That's uh, what sensory is there to do, is to provide you some feedback uh, using samples that you've prepared to see, do they really like that product you've just created? Um, sensory evaluation is also referred to by some people as taste testing. So if you hear taste testing and sensory evaluation, they're essentially the same, same terminology. I will just give you a very uh, quick overview of food safety uh, issues and a refresher. Um, talk a little bit about the basis for recipes and then finish off with where do I find information. And um, recognize that with, with some of this, it's just going to be a brief uh, direction as to where you can find information, not necessarily a detailed, um, detailed discussion of uh, where to get every piece of information. In a, in a few weeks, uh, you will be hearing a, a talk about the cottage food laws. Um, so I really won't talk anything about that today because I feel it's going to be covered in, in two weeks. So to get started then on product development, it's important to understand first what is the real definition of product development. And what's important is that it, this is a process. So it's a process where we we create this concept and we convert this concept uh, into a food product that can then be uh, sold at the marketplace. So it's, it's, it's really, again, a process. So to understand that process will give you a better uh, outcome when it comes to selling of your uh, particular product. So one of the important parts about uh, product development is this concept of a market assessment. And this is really where you want to begin because uh, oftentimes we think that we make something at home, your family loves it, let me package it and sell it. Uh, the issue is, is that maybe uh, it's not really what people want. You know, because there's already a certain number of products on the market. They already have a favorite one. They consume all the time. So really then, it's, again, important to, to think about what is it that products, what products are out there that people want or what products are not out there that people want. So you have to think kind of both directions, that there might be something that's only one product on the market exists and people want more options, or it might be something completely not even on the market that people are actually wanting. Uh, to give you some data with regards to uh, commercial food production from, from large food corporations, for example, some statistics show that 72% of the new products, so 72% of these new introductions fail within three years. So the, the failure rate, some companies say one year, others say three years. Um, but when we talk about new products, is these are products that are, are the first time entry into the market maybe, or are a, a product we define as a me too product where there's already something like that uh, out there and you're just kind of duplicating that product. Um, 
that's considered a new product. Um, in that case, again, high percent of failure, 72%. The other types of failures deal with line extensions. And line extensions um, are essentially um, products that already exist and you're just adding a new flavor. Um, a good example of, of a line extension would be um, like uh, sometimes you see uh, products like rice aroni where you have one flavor and then they can't come out with another flavor the next year or potato chips like Lay's potato chips where you have one chip flavor and then they come out with a new chip flavor the next year. That's kind of a line extension. Um, so um, again, as expected, we would see that um, the line extensions fail less often than new, new products. So again, if you're thinking about creating a product, this is something that you want to be aware of is, is this a product that people are actually wanting? The other part of market assessment, and, and these are just a couple of ideas. I mean, uh, there are uh, other, other options out there, but, but these are two things that at, at least at a minimum you should be thinking about. And the second one here is referred to as a SWOT analysis, a strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. And, and I'll cover this in a little bit more detail for you, but just recognizing that you want to have a, your, a product idea that has more strengths than weaknesses, and you want that product also to have more opportunity than threats. And so that's the kind of the general idea is that you want to have something that has more strengths and opportunities than weaknesses and, and, and threats. And when we, we start to look at SWAT, there's a couple of very simple questions that you can address. Um, without really starting to do any surveys. Um, in a product development class that we have, our students oftentimes will do a Facebook survey to get information. So that might be something that, that even you could do, a Facebook survey or something very similar. A few of the questions then that, that you want to start to think about because that can help you address that SWOT analysis. And the first question here, deals with uh, the primary customer. So who are the primary customers of your product? Are you looking at a specific age group, uh, a certain economic background? Are you gonna rely on tradition, like certain people eat lefsa, and, and are you gonna rely on, on the tradition of eating that, that product as something that's gonna uh, be important to you and help you sell your product. The other important aspect, is there a unique niche, a certain type of, of flavor um, that's not on the market, um, a certain type of berry that might be just uh, native to North Dakota and that you can make a product with it and you know, you'd have a, a, a niche type of, of product. Uh, the second question here is, what products are you competing against in the marketplace? And for most people, they think of consumer packaged products. But could your product actually go into a food service? Maybe your local, uh, you know, a, a local company uh, might uh, say, yes, I would like this, and then our company will sell it to somebody else. So that would be another, another uh, path. So think about who are you competing with in your particular example? Also, another important question to address is, could this be this product be a direct competitor, some, some other product, or an indirect competitor? A direct competitor is product versus product. They're, they're basically two products that are the same type. So we'll say uh, salsa, for example. So you have salsa A and salsa B. That is a direct, a direct competitor in that environment. Is that who you're, you're challenging is, is basically that type of product or are you doing more of this indirect uh, product uh, introduction where your product meets the needs to replace another? Uh, for example, for, for diabetics, uh, jams and jellies can be an issue. And so can you create uh, a jam or jelly for someone with diabetes? 
And, and so it's a case where you're replacing that traditional jam or jelly with, with this diabetic version or a, a version that the diabetic patient can consume. The uh, next question here, uh, why should someone buy your product? So, so what, are, what are your selling points? Um, or the selling points of your product, because that that is important to know, and that's very important when you start to combine your SWOT analysis, because uh, you are looking at at a case: is it more nutritious? Is it convenient? Uh, you can make it cheaper, so therefore the cost is going to be lower. Does it have a a, a certain sensory or flavor that's uh, that's different, and that's going to be uh, what sells your product versus some other other product. And then finally, uh, how are you going to make your product um, and what are your major challenges for your product? Um, do you have the necessary equipment or do you have to buy equipment? Remember that equipment's gonna add ex uh, cost to that, that product. And so uh, again, it's important to uh, identify that early on um, do you have uh, the necessary ingredients um, or are those ingredients available to you and are, are they cost efficient for you? So if they're cost prohibitive, then maybe you have to find different ingredients um, and it might not create the same type of product. So again, ingredient availability, ingredient costs are really always important uh, factors. If you're growing your own vegetables, you're going to make a salsa-based product. That's going to be a cheaper, more available product to you uh, than if you, you go to a grocery store or go to a wholesaler, it's going to cost a little bit more. Uh, then the shelf life of your product. Um, you're making this product. Does it have to be consumed within three weeks? Or can it sit on the shelf after it's been processed for a year and still be good? So it's, it's important to define to find that, and then finally, do you have the processing experience? Um, you need to, to understand the processing aspects of that, that uh, product, and again, uh, with this particular situation, it might be that you need to ask people. So um, in some cases, you might have to hire um, somebody that, that has that experience uh, to help you, you through the, the process of making that product. So let's just use a, an example and to do uh, follow through with SWOT analysis. And one of the things that uh, I highlight here, and this could apply to any, any food item. Uh, this is, a, the idea here is a frozen Italian soup bowls. So all you really are so the person's interested in making this soup bowl, and now we're really making is is the the Italian bread, and then we're going to cut out the top and hollow out the the bread uh, part of that bowl. And so we're we're taking that product then, and we're going to freeze it. And so we're going to have these frozen Italian uh, soup bowls that we want to sell. So in this particular case, then. We're, we're basically going to be looking at strengths. Uh, so the, a strength of this product could be that you're making these pre-made soup bowls that can be um, removed from the freezer. You just throw it in the oven and bake it, and then you fill that with the soup that you've, you've made. So that would be a strength there would be convenience, just pulling out that, that soup bowl. You don't have to make the dough. You don't have to um, bake the bread, you don't have to cut it out, you don't have to fill it up. So, so your product is gonna be something that they just pull out of the freezer, throw in the oven to, to warm it up, and then uh, throw in the appropriate soup. So that's kind of the, the product that um, we're intending to make. A weakness though could be that you have competitors in that the local grocery store has a bakery aisle, and in that bakery aisle, they already make soup bowls, so if the person's interested in a soup bowl, they would have to, they could just stop by the store and pick it up and, and take it home and throw in their soup and, and they have one. So, so the idea here is to look at a strength 
versus a weakness. Um, and we could pull out many other strengths and weaknesses, but I'm just going to highlight two just for the sake of, of time. Um, opportunity, um, you know, is there an opportunity there? Well, if there's nothing, uh, if there's nothing um, on the market that exists like this, then, you know, there's opportunity there. Um, especially if it's a frozen one that you can you can pull out, and then finally the threat. The threat would be that that um, basically there would be um, a competitor already making a product like this, or that this would be only um, a, a short-term product in the sense that maybe from a December through February time period, where maybe more people eat soup, less people eat. Uh, maybe a soup bowl at those times. So a threat might be just a short term uh, time of the year that would, would be successful. Um, so that's kind of your SWOT analysis and you want to, um, you want to uh, basically kind of go through that exercise just to kind of see will, how will your, your product kind of uh, stand out versus uh, potential competitors. Um, there is one question I should uh, address here. Uh, the question is, any suggestion tips to, to conduct a shelf life study on a product at home? Uh, how long will my barbecue sauce last after it has been opened? Um, so, so in this particular case, one of the things that I oftentimes tell people is that, that you want to have some people that you feel can really evaluate your product for you in the sense that they can tell you that they sense um, if you're using brown sugar in that recipe or you use honey in there and they can tell you that, oh, I kind of have this taste of honey in the barbecue sauce and it's something that, that they like. And so they could pick that out for you. And so what you oftentimes could then ask those people to come in and say, hey, can you taste this product? And see, do you pick up those notes that you did when you first opened the product or you first made a batch of that product? So that is one approach that you would have in terms of, of a shelf life. Um, typically, um, with barbecue sauces, uh, we oftentimes want to, uh, we want to try to use it up uh, you know, 14 days uh, to 30 days. Oftentimes we recommend just for the sake of freshness. Um, oftentimes in a refrigerator, because you're under acid environments and you're in refrigerated temperatures, um, that usually helps uh, preserve some of that, that product a little bit longer. So it's important that when you, you talk about shelf life, Oftentimes with, with some of these products, it's more an issue of just quality changes that, that happen. Um, so, so with that, we'll kind of move on. And, and at the end, if there's other questions around that, I will, uh, can talk a little bit more in detail. So what I want to do now is move into, um, I want to move into um, how do I know my product is the best? And that's, uh, one thing that's very important, um, when we, we address this particular question, we rely on sensory science to do that. And sensory science is a scientific method used to evoke, measure, analyze, and interpret those responses to products as perceived through the sense of sight, smell, touch, taste, and hearing. So that's kind of the, the definition that's been out there for you know, almost uh, 30 years now. Um, but the idea here is that we, we get a response uh, from people tasting a particular product. And that's the, the whole goal of, of, of a sensory science. What's very important to remember with sensory science is that there are multiple uh, there are multiple uh, techniques that are available. Um, however, it's, it's uh, once you get to the point of, of going to consumers, we start to look at, at preference. We start to evaluate acceptance, also referred to as liking. So these are our, our tests that we oftentimes will do. But what's very important here is to get objective opinions. 
uh, one of the uh, important uh, things to remember is that, uh, you know, sometimes your, your kids, uh, your husband or wife, uh, your mom or dad, maybe these aren't necessarily the best people to collect scientific information on because they may not always be 100% honest with you. Um, so it's important to understand that you want this objective opinion. So people that you don't, you know, they could be people that you know, but you would trust that they would give you an honest answer to uh, the evaluation of that product. So in this particular case, um, again, preference and acceptance or liking are the two tests that we oftentimes will do because they're specifically targeted for consumer type of data collection. Uh, so the first thing here would be a preference. Uh, so in a preference testing, uh, we use what we define as a paired comparison test or a ranking. So those are the two tests we commonly do. In a paired comparison test, you're just simply comparing two products. Um, and these two products are, are fed to the, the sensory panelist. And then they're asked basically just to circle or write on it in, a, in the, the line here uh, what product they prefer. Okay, so it's just a, they prefer one sample over another. That's all they're, that they are, are doing in this particular situation. When it comes to a ranking test, a ranking test involves four samples or three samples. So it's usually more than two. So, so three, three or more. Um, in this particular case, then you ask them to evaluate the product and they would rank the products from one to four in terms of how, how much they prefer the, the particular set of samples. Um, again, this, this is a very simple test. It's designed for uh, consumers. Uh, so it's not, not a very complicated uh, approach. Uh, but at the end of this study, it's very important to, that you know uh, what we are allowed to say about this product. And the first one here is that it indicates product is preferred. That's all it does. It says that this product is preferred over the, the other. So there is, no, um, there is no information about whether or not the panelists actually like the product. It just tells us that they prefer that product. Uh, it also allows us to measure the relative order of preference between several samples. So in that ranking test, we had four samples. It would tell us a relative order. It doesn't quantify that, that preference uh, because we're just asking them to rank it from one to four in terms of, of which products they prefer. So that's a disadvantage to this is we get qu uh, qualitative assessments and not a really quantitative set of data. But it also, done properly can allow you to do an ad claim about your product. Uh, in, in the 70s and 80s, there was always a lot of commercials where Coke and Pepsi were doing taste tests and, and, and uh, one would say that their product was preferred over another. Um, it, but the one thing that I do want to caution you about is that if you want to make an ad claim, uh, you have to have the sensory done at a third party. So the third party has to actually do the sensory evaluation and, and they would then provide information back to you about what product was preferred. Uh, so um, I just want to caution you again that, that with preference, you can use it in an ad claim provided that, that a third party lab or sensory uh, laboratory would actually do the test. In acceptance, acceptance now gives us an indication of liking. Uh, we oftentimes will use hedonic scaling. Hedonic scaling is, is um, designed to give you a sense of the liking or the level of liking of your product. Um, hedonic scales, there's uh, word hedonic scales, and they range from like extremely down to dislike extremely. Uh, so if you have a product that's on this disliking side of this, the scale, you know that there's an issue and you probably have to change the formulation. However, if you're up at like extremely and like very much, then you know that, hey, people really uh, 
do like the product. And, and so um, hedonic scaling is nice because you get these differences here. Uh, it's also adaptable. So you can use what we define as facial hedonic scales. So you have uh, boys and girls, and, and they all understand that if you have happy hearts and stuff, they understand that that would indicate they really like it. But if they have thumbs down, that means they don't like it or it's, uh, dislike it uh, extensively. So th the nice thing about hedonic scales, they are adaptable uh, to your audience of interest. Uh, just keep in mind that you're not going to use a facial hedonic scale for a teenager, uh, for a middle schooler, high schooler, even even uh, adults. So it, it's not something that you would you would use for that population. But if you have six to ten year olds, six to eleven year olds in that range, they'd probably work on that population. The other type of of testing is a just right. And just right is, is oftentimes referred to as an optimizing technique. Um, it, it, it has this implied uh, acceptance to it. Um, your goal in, in a product formulation is to, to hit the just right uh, part of the scale because that means that, that your panelists say that a specific attribute such as gravy color is just right. It's not too light, it's not too dark, but it's just right. So that implies that it, there's some sort of liking in there. The amount of vegetables, you know, too few versus too many, and then there's a point where there's just right. So the idea behind a just right is that it's more of an optimizing, it allows you to change your formulation uh, during that development stage. So if you, if you put a lot of vegetables in there and people tell you there's way too many vegetables, then you would reformulate to cut back and then hope the next time that maybe they hit just right. So um, again, just recognizing with, with preference tells us only preference acceptance is more of, of the liking um, type of, of scale. It also allows for more of the optimization. So there's a advantages, a little bit more advantages to go on with the acceptance testing than, than preference. What can we say then at the end of this test? We can um, basically uh, indicate the degree of product liking. Is it extremely liked? Is it extremely disliked? Uh, we get a relative order of acceptance between samples. So if you have uh, two, three, four samples, you get a relative order in terms of, of uh, how much they like that product. Um, in the just right, the nice uh, thing about the just right scale, um, and we oftentimes use this early on in the, the process development, is because we want to uh, identify your best formulation. And so you have formulations and recipe changes that might be needed. This particular type of scaling is is um, very useful because it allows you to do that. So it gives you what we define as actionable information. So I, I mentioned too many vegetables. Well, your action then is to reduce the amount of vegetables in that product. So that's um, essentially um, how to think about these particular types of sensory tests. So with that, then introductory to uh, the product development side of, of things to think about. I want to move into the food safety refresher and I will not spend much time um, covering a lot of details here. I've, I've done that in previous webinars. Um, but before I get into this, I see I have a question. Uh, how many panelists do you have uh, for sensory evaluation on a product? And with, with the just about right, so when I do the just about right scale, I'm typically around 10 to 15 panelists because it's just easier to manage 10 or 15 panelists or 10, 10 or 15 people that can evaluate your product. Also what, what oftentimes is helpful is, is that you get the same panelists to, to evaluate after every change if you can. So, so that way it's a little bit more, more uh, easier to manage when you're down with 10 or 15. Plus you get, you get a lot of good information with that, that number of panelists. When you get into acceptance testing or preference testing, so you have a finished product and you're gonna run acceptance or a preference testing, then you wanna be up to that, that 50 to 100 range is, is typically the minimum that we, we suggest if you, you can do that. So, so that's the kind of the range that, 
that we oftentimes will do. Some of the larger manufacturers, they go up to 200 panelists oftentimes. But, but I have found that, that for a lot of the work that we have done in the past, when you, you're at right around that, that 75 mark, it seems to be a, a good uh, number of panelists that give you good information and, and something that represents really the, that product that's being evaluated. So again, 50 would definitely be the bare modes minimum there. Um, 100 would be ideal, um, but you don't have to go to that two or 300 that some other uh, large corporations would go to. Uh, so let me jump back then to the, the food safety refresher. Uh, keep in mind that the FDA, they um, really cl uh, classify food into three, three classes or categories. They have a low acid. This would be a pH greater than 4.6. An acid food is one that is naturally acidic, so it has naturally a pH of less than four points, less than or equal to 4.6. So it's a case where, where again, I want to stress the word natural. So if you pick it off a tree or you pick it off a bush uh, and it has a pH that's 4.6 or less, that's a natural, uh, naturally acidic. And then acidified is the third category. And the pH here would be less than or equal to 4.6 by the addition of acid. So that's really the important thing to remember is that it's an acid addition that, that makes it acidic in nature. So just again, some examples here. Uh, we have fruits such as berries and apples, uh, fermented products such as sauerkrauts and pickles. Um, these are considered acid foods. Um, and, and so you can look on this little image here and uh, you can see that the majority of your fruits um, fall in this particular category. The majority of your berries probably fall in this, this category as well. Um, again, with, with sauerkraut and pickles, it's very important that, that during that fermentation, the pH drops to sufficiently acid conditions to make it an acid food. So. Um, again, it's always important to understand what is the acid of my, my sauerkraut, what is the acid of my pickles if I'm doing a fermentation. A low acid is basically all vegetables. So all your vegetables, you just as basically assume that they are going to be um, low acid. Uh, also, I want to be, uh, you to be uh, very much aware that um, some of the fruits, like the melons, uh, the watermelons in particular, uh, they are not acid. So melons, cantaloupe, honeydew, these are not acid in nature. They're falling in that low acid category. So it's very important to understand that just because we classify them as a fruit from a market perspective, it may not necessarily be uh, low acid. So don't, don't assume that all fruits are acid. It, it's important to know the difference. And then meat products feel fall in this low acid environment. We also then have acidified food, and this is any food that is sufficient, uh, has sufficient acid, and your acids could be lemon juice, vinegar, citric acid, these are ones that would be added, that would make that product have an equilibrium pH of 4.6 or less. And an equilibrium pH is one where the solid particles in that food has the same pH as the liquid portions. So you can't just stick a pH probe into your salsa and say, oh, yes, my salsa is 3.8 for a pH. But then you, you separate out the onions or peppers in there and you grind these up with a little distilled water and you take the pH and now you see, oh, wait a minute, it's, it's not 3.8, it's 4.9. So it's, it's very important to understand that an equilibrium pH means that, that every material in there is at the same pH level. And, and that's, again, very important uh, parameter to uh, remember. So when we look at, at uh, processing products, some of the basis for recipes that you would see that are on the USDA uh, guidelines, um, are very much dependent on the nature of that product. So always remember that anything that is an acid food or acidified food, 
a boiling water bath canner is, is generally uh, going to be the way that you would process that. Um, with pressure canning, pressure canning, uh, you have a low acid food or mixtures of, of acid and, and low acid. So it's not really necessarily being acidified, it's just that you have some, some tomatoes in there and maybe you're, you're putting um, maybe some, some apples in there, some applesauce along with your tomatoes, but then you have some peppers and um, um, onions and, and other components that you are adding to that mixture. And so in that particular case, it's a mixture of the two. So you're not necessarily then adding acid to it. So you're not acidifying it. So it's important to remember that when we talk about mixtures of acid and low acid, it may not necessarily be acidified, but, but in that particular case, when they are a mixture, you really need to do pressure canning. What's also very important to understand is that there's really low acid canned food products um, are very highly regulated in the sense that you have to show uh, a lot of data before you can submit products to the, the public. And so uh, basically home canned products just cannot be sold publicly just because of the, the nature of that, that product. Um, and, and why is that? So why all this concern about the, the recipe and, and how to process it. Um, it goes again back to what I had showed you earlier with that, that uh, family, that uh, number of people died in it. And, and essentially what they died from was uh, uh, botulism. And botulism is a result of Clostridium botulinum. This is um, uh, an organism that uh, produces a toxin that is one of the deadliest ones that we know of. Um, one milligram can kill 655 tons of mice. So we're not saying 655 mice, we're, we're saying 655 tons of mice. And so, uh, of course, one milligram is, is a lot, but uh, at the same time, 655 tons of mice is a lot also. Uh, foods can contain toxic without showing signs. So you can't look at it and say, oh, there's botulism toxin in that. Um, Keep in mind that there is an antitoxin available, uh, but it still results in a slow recovery and sometimes permanent nerve damage results. So um, again, it's, it's a concern that we would have because again, this toxin can kill people um, and it's done by suffocation because it, it uh, uh, paralyzes the, the diaphragm so your lungs don't work correctly. And so what happens oftentimes then is that uh, Clostridium botulinum organisms will germinate. And once it germinates, it uh, into a, a, a bacterium, so it, it's in a spore form, that spore then germinates into a bacterium. Once this bacterium is growing, it multiplies. And one of the products that results from this during this growth phase is a waste material, of course, but more importantly, the toxin. So you have to have live organisms there to produce these toxins. Um, and so um, if that organism has some point in time is, is uh, growing, that toxin might be in that particular product. What's very important to remember though is that in order for this particular spore to germinate and, and grow into a, a bacterium, it needs to have anaerobic environments, so usually less than 2% oxygen. It has low acid requirements, so pH is greater than 4.6, a temperature st of storage of 40 to 120 Fahrenheit, and then finally, uh, relatively high moisture content. So if you eliminate any one of those conditions, you're reducing your chance of this particular organism, organism being present. What's very important also to remember that these spores, we consume these spores all the time. So they're in the environment. Uh, so anytime you eat a, a vegetable, you might be eating a spore. But the, the issue here is, is that that spore is inert. 
it doesn't cause you any harm. It's only when that spore germinates into the live bacteria, that is when the problems arise because that bacteria produces this toxin, okay? And in a product that you might, that, such as a, a green pea, where you might just put it in a, a salad of some sort, you're not necessarily doing a heat treatment on that, that pea. And so if that toxin is present, there is that possibility that you could get botulism from that. So again, this organism is really the main concern with the canning industry just because it is so deadly. Uh, so where do I start then? Uh, if you're interested in making a home canned product, you know, you need to identify uh, first the product that you're, that you're interested in selling. So that's the first step. If you go through that, the first part of the presentation that I highlighted and say, okay, yeah, this is the product that I actually want to make. Then you ask, does the product meet the FDA definition of acid or acidified food? If the answer is no, if this is a hermetically sealed high water activity food, so a canned product, for example, or something in a jar, uh, that is not eligible for processing at home for commercial sale. Okay, so that's that low acid environment. However, if you say yes, it is an acidified food, you can process that at home for commercial sales. Um, if it's following the FDA definition of acidify or acid food, all right? Find your USDA approved recipes. Um, I'll give you additional information later. And then identify the function and pH of the ingredient because that allows you to kind of get a better sense of if I add a certain ingredient, is that gonna make my product more or less acidic? And so that's a, an important thing to, to think about as you're doing product formulations. Uh, just a, a quick overview here on, on pH of ingredients. You know, we talked about uh, fruits. You know, we look at apples. Apples have a pH anywhere from um, approximately 3.1 up to 4.0. So it's, it's important to understand that what product are you uh, going to use in your, your fortification? Are you using an apple juice, an apple sauce, uh, or are you using a certain type of, of apple? You know, it, it's important just to get a sense of, of what product you're actually evaluating. The other um, ingredients that are common ingredients that you might have would be butter, uh, cornstarch, corn syrup, flour, honey, molasses, sugar, vinegar. And as you can see here, that when you add a cornstarch, that could dramatically increase the pH of your product because cornstarch itself is, uh, has a pH of seven, typically. Um, and so the idea here would be that, that you are very much aware of what the pH of those ingredients are. Um, this particular slide just shows you, again, and I, I want you to think, you know, as you, as you uh, get done with the seminar now, just kind of go back and look at this list but the role of ingredients, fruits and vegetables, of course, they're the, the flavor, they're the texture, the color. Uh, fruits are acid, vegetables are low acid. Uh, sugar, um, sugar is, its primary role is as a, as a flavoring, but it also is a preservative. So sugar acts as a preservative because it, under the right environment, a high sugar, not many things can grow in that, especially some of those pathogenic organisms. So, but the issue here is that it's low acid. So if you're adding sugar to your recipe, keep in mind that it might change the pH uh, to be in less acid in nature. Uh, salt, very similar to sugar. There's, it's a flavoring, it acts as a preservative, uh, but it, again, it's, it's a low acid ingredient. Uh, some other, other um, Products we'd have cornstarch, that's a texture and viscosity, that's low acid. We have pectin, which provides texture. So in jams and jelly, um, that particular product um, gives that structure or firmness to that jam or jelly. It uh, can be low acid to acid because it depending on what type you get. Um, calcium chloride enhances firmness of products, especially like dill pickles. This is a low acid product. Lemon juice, vinegar, uh, provides acidity and flavor that's 
in that acid category. And then finally, citric acid is just gives acidity and uh, tartness, but that's acidic in nature from a pH perspective. And then the last set here, we have corn syrup. It's a considered low acid. Honey is actually a, considered acidic. Again, purpose for sweetness. And then spices and herbs, they enhance flavor, but they are uh, low acid. So when you have your formulation, I want you to create a, a spreadsheet, basically, of the ingredients, give what is their function in that product, and then what is the pH of that product. Because by understanding that, uh, you kind of understand why is it that you're putting that in the product um, and how it might ultimately affect the pH. And so I have an example here where when you look at apple chutney, uh, you have your, your apples. Apples give your texture, they provide flavor, they provide acid. That particular pH of that uh, uh, basically prepared apple is gonna be between 3.2 and 3.55. So you have a case where acid in nature. However, when you look at a chopped onion, it's there primarily for flavor, uh, but the problem is, is it's, it's low acid. A bell pepper, there for flavoring, it again is, is low acid. Um, so as you work your way through the list, um, it's important just to uh, understand then uh, what is the pH of these products. Um, because when a, a recipe is approved, they look at you know, the functionality, look at the pH, and then you have an overall pH. And if, if you're still on that uh, low acid side of the pH scale, you, know, you might have to add more vinegar to that formulation or add citric acid to that recipe. So again, it's important to understand functionality of your ingredients and how that might adjust your, your, your pH. Uh, so where do I go to get food safe recipes? Um, the first thing and first site I recommend going to is the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Um, they have uh, a, a number of, of documents here to read through. Uh, but there are some that are very specific to what you might want to produce or a product that would be similar. So again, take a look at that particular uh, website because again, it provides, um, it provides information about the uh, USDA guidelines. Uh, we also have the NDSU extension part. Um, and, and with that, uh, Julie highlighted this particular website last week. Again, this is a food preservation site. So you have a lot of good information about canning and freezing and drying. Um, you know, my discussions so far have been on canning, but you might have other products that you're interested. So again, here's another set of, of or a nice website for you to look at uh, some recipes and formulations. Um, also, uh, ball canning. Uh, it's actually freshpreserving.com is really what the web address is, but it takes you to uh, Ball Blue Book. And, and there's a number of, of formulations in there and products that you can make. Uh, it's very easy to use. Um, they have a section on recipes, so you can take a look at these recipes and say, okay, these are, this is something that I want to make. It, it's a case where um, you know, some things have already been done, so you may not have to reinvent the wheel on, on certain things. So, so again, these are um, food safe uh, recipes that, that, you know, has Kerr and Ball have really created this site with that in mind that it's, it, these are, are, are safe products to make. What happens if I don't want to necessarily sell a canned product? Um, What's very important to understand then is that um, you still wanna look at your, your, your ingredients and identify what are some of the functionalities of, of those ingredients. Keep in mind that organisms tend not to grow as easily in uh, acid environments. 
compared to a low acid environments. So, so they tend not to grow as easily in as acid environments. So in our particular uh, Mexican beans and in corn salad, and this is an NDSU extension service uh, 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 salad, um, a couple of things that are important. You have the vinegar, so you have red wine vinegar, you have lime juice. Um, both of these actually can acidify uh, with lime juice being more acidic, of course. Um, but they can both acidify that. Of course, wine vinegar adds some flavor to it. Um, but, but again, uh, that helps to acidify that, that particular salad. Uh, what's very important to remember, though, is that as you're developing these types of, of formulas, check with the, the Department of Health, the food and lodging for guidance, uh, because they might have some, some rules. Retail outlets might have additional uh, rules. So it's important to, to uh, check that out. Um, this would be another example of uh, an old-fashioned potato salad. And this is, again, a NDSU um, uh, formulation or recipe uh, that, that, again, is, is safe. Um, and so when you see these recipes, just think of, think of the, 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 the time they had spent to make sure it, it, it meets uh, the appropriate uh, conditions uh, for, for that sale of that product. So they're not going to can this in a can, this type of product, but it could be sold to a deli possibly. Um, also then, uh, some additional information can be found uh, at government website. So the state, the state is, is always a good site because uh, the health department, specifically the food and lodging, uh, Department of Food and Lodging really has guidance for, for health uh, inspections and, and, and some, some of the laws and rules required for processing. Extension services, I just highlight a, a UC Davis file here. I've, I've already provided you some for NDSU. Uh, then at the federal level, we have USDA and, and FDA, um, where I always recommend people just kind of scan the FDA and look for acid and acidified foods and see all the information that's readily available for you. And then commercial websites such as Ball Corporation, um, freshpreserving.com. Um, that is uh, a, a site that I oftentimes recommend to people. Um, I may not necessarily recommend other commercial sites, but, but this is one I feel like they've invested a lot of time and history uh, in, in canning. And then, again, some learning modules. So, again, on the food nutrition site at, at, under the food entrepreneurship, there's some learning modules that, that can also help give you um, some, some good information. Um, so, again, on some of our, our, our chat box here, uh, just keep in mind that uh, the extension counties or offices oftentimes have poster displays of, of safe canning. Uh, they ha also have stuff posted on their websites with, with recipes and so forth. Um, and, and I think that that's important to, to look at. Uh, one of the questions here is, is please comment on options for us uh, on hot fill uh, versus boiling water for sealing acidified foods for food entrepreneurs. Um, I always tell people that the safest route is the, the boiling um, water bath method. Um, one of the issues that, that you oftentimes can happen with, with hot fill products is not getting the appropriate seal. Um, so I think that that one would be one concern, whereas if it was a boiling water bath, you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about that. Um, of course, uh, you would you would always um, want to make sure you see that vacuum being created. Um, but generally, um, I'll, I'll even let Julie pop in if she has any comments about the hot fill products. But but they oftentimes have to be uh, very hot to, to fill. And and a lot of the hot fill uh, products that are on the the market oftentimes, uh, you know 
can reach 135 degrees uh, Celsius, which is really extremely hot. So um, uh, with that, if, if Julie wants to say anything, uh, please feel free. I see that Julie said she, her microphone doesn't work. <laughs> But uh, um, you can contact me later. So it's uh, I, I would suggest on that hot fill. It's, it's probably I'd have to look for for more information for you. I don't have it top of my head, but but maybe Julie can comment on the text box if she can. Um, so um, Susanna has mentioned that the University of Wisconsin has a fact sheet. So um, I think. It's important just to, to double check with if it's going to be a product sold in, in North Dakota, just check with the, the health department. That's the, I think the first, first step of that, that process. So with that, um, I see I got about a minute left. Um, if you have any other last minute questions, otherwise, uh, I think Julie will be posting this and uh, you can always come back and listen to it for a second time. So.